Hello and welcome to the Visible Women Podcast. I'm Kim DeBrew, and along with co-host Corinne Corbett, we put issues related to diversity, inclusion, and appearance in the spotlight and examine how they impact the lives of women of color. Our conversation today is a critical one as we use our platform to elevate the voices of women of color and girls of color. Today's episode in the field of science, technology, engineering, and math, fields that are often invisible for women and especially women of color, STEM fields. Building the pipeline of students to STEM as a policy priority has emerged both at the state level and national level as our country is seeking to develop a workforce that can address the economy of not just today, but tomorrow. From my prior work, I've noticed a number of initiatives that have focused on generating interest in children at the youngest age ages into STEM fields. And most immediately, students in, at the undergraduate and graduate levels have been partnering with companies in Silicon Valley. A number of recent partnerships have emerged from minority-serving institutions, the National Science Foundation, the National Society of Black Engineers, private philanthropy, all are investing in this kind of work. At the local level, school robotics competitions, uh, such as some of the ones my 12-year-old has been involved in, F- efforts like Black Girls Code, STEM career fairs, expos, hosted at venues across the country, really aimed at getting the word out that careers in STEM are for everyone, and especially girls of color. Now, some of these efforts, in spite of their best intentions really run up against a very persistent and stubborn stereotype. I think if you asked many adults and even some children to envision, to close their eyes and envision what a scientist looks like, what a mathematician looks like, the image that would come to mind still might be someone with glasses, perhaps, someone with a long white lab coat, and probably white and male. So today we're gonna really talk about a promising program that really is aimed at addressing some of those stereotypes. And it not, doesn't just work at a national level, but works at a global level. I'd love to hear a bit from you, Corinne, about your, your work in this tech space. You know, your career change has, uh, has had you step into, in a full way, um, the tech world. Any thoughts about this topic? So I think this is an important subject because as you, as you mentioned, that, that women in STEM overall are largely invisible and women of color in particular are invisible. And when, and, and they're seen as unicorns if they are, you know, uh, you know highlighted. But there are so many opportunities in the STEM field, and it's one of those things that if we don't prepare ourselves for them, then we cannot take advantage of them. So I'll first tell you how I became involved in STEM. Uh, I started, and most of my career has been as a journalist uh, and magazine editor. And as we know, print magazines are no longer viable from in most instances. So. I did start working in digital media a little bit. And when I started to become an entrepreneur and work on my Beauty Biz Camp program, where I was working with girls and women, I decided to go back to school just to get a better understanding of entrepreneurship. And I chose a program at the University of Maryland College Park that was focused on technology entrepreneurship. And it was in the School of Engineering. And it was eye-opening because I thought that I was going to be totally in over my head because I'm coming from an art degree. But I learned just how much I love technology. And it has become, you know, a a guiding passion. And I look at what, what, in the work that I do, I look at how technology intersects with the beauty industry and the fashion industry and and lifestyle categories and how we can use it to not only 
reach customers, particularly customers of color, better, but how consumers can be empowered by using this technology. So let's talk a little bit about the stats, though. Globally, women are less likely to enter the field and more likely to lead overall. But when it comes to college majors, it's only less than 20% of all of the women majoring in STEM are majoring in science, engineering, and technology. There's a lot of majors in the life sciences category, in medicine. and When you look at the ethnic breakdown of those in, in, in college, 2.9% are Black, 3.6% are Latina or Hispanic, and 4.8% are Asian. And Latinas make up less than 10% of women in tech right now. So there's a huge opportunity. So as, as, as Kim mentioned, there have been some partnerships. I know Google with uh, Howard and some other programs. Spotify has been doing some, some um, initiatives at HBCUs. But there's also opportunities at Hispanic-leaning institutions that should be explored as well to increase the diversity in tech. And I, I see that women have, there's a lot of, uh, of opportunity for us but we have to have the information early so that we can be prepared. We can't come to college with this idea that we want to be in STEM with no knowledge of it. It's, it it's, a, it's a little bit more of a challenge. So preparing our girls early would be the ideal situation. So there's Black girls who code, there's girls who code. But what if you're not in a school that has that? Uh, th that's what makes this program just exciting. So we have some amazing guests today from MasterCard. And they're going to tell us about a innovative program that they've established to increase the number of young women entering STEM and increasing the interest in the STEM field. Our guests today are Marissa Grimes and Dana Lorberg. Marissa Grimes leads inclusion and diversity efforts for MasterCard North America's business. And she's responsible for aligning the company's diversity and inclusion initiatives with the region's business strategy to ensure employees from all walks of life feel valued and respected and have the opportunity to reach their greatest potential. She comes to this role from the Global Communications Department of MasterCard. Dana J. Lorberg is Executive Vice President of Operations and Technology Product for MasterCard. She's responsible for MasterCard's technology platforms, including network processing in support of credit, debit, and prepaid products, commercial solutions, and many more things. And she provides operations and technology in close alignment to MasterCard's core product business. She's been at MasterCard for more than 30 years. So she has a knowledge of how technology has helped this company grow. And so we'll be interested in, to learn her perspective on not only the program, but its implications for the business. Welcome to the show, Marissa and Dana. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So my first question for you is, MasterCard is a technology company? I, I never thought of the company as, techno, as a technology company. I always thought of it as a credit card company. So, so how is MasterCard a technology company? Uh, thank you. So MasterCard is a technology company. You can imagine in the financial industry how important and critical technology is to our business. You might think of us as a credit card company, maybe one that's uh, just U.S.-based, but that would all be a myth because the reality is it is our technology that we have built and created that spans the globe that makes sure payments are happening every day in a safe simple and smart way for uh, con consumers around the planet. Awesome. So as a spinoff, Girls for Tech then seems to make perfect sense it, and holds great promise for middle school girls across the world. We'd love to hear a little bit about how the initiative got started, who was the target when you set out on this path, and what were the initial goals of the effort? Sure, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so, so Dana kind of gave a, in broad strokes, how MasterCard views itself and, and operates in the world as a technology company. When you think about it, 
we are a network connecting buyers and sellers all over the world, and those people are from all different walks of life. So that we know that company and the tech industry as a whole will be stronger in the future when those who are working in the industry are just as diverse as the customers and markets we serve. So we need more women, we need more people of color, we need more people with disabilities and other diverse groups who are working in STEM. And that's one of the reasons we launched Girls for Tech, um, really to encourage more girls to go into STEM now so that we can build the pipeline for the future. Uh, because I think one of your stats mentioned, um, right now, less than one in 20 girls considers a career a career in STEM compared to one in five boys. So we launched Girls, girls for Tech, which is MasterCard's signature STEM curriculum in 2014, um, really to address that gap. And the program is based on global science and math standards, but it also showcases our payments technology as a company. And one of the really cool things about the program is that it's led internally and it's totally supported by MasterCard volunteers. So employees around the world at MasterCard serve as mentors, teaching the girls um, who are usually around the middle school age about things like algorithms and encryption and fraud detection and data analysis. It's just really an amazing program and Dana and I have both been really fortunate to participate in it um, several times. And you know, as Marissa said, it's uh, it's not just that we are interested in bringing more girls into the STEM field so that we give back to the world. Of course, we're interested in giving back to the world and paying it forward and, as we say at MasterCard, doing well by doing good. But it is really important to our business. Uh, we are a technology business. I like to say I'm a girl geek and I'm proud of it. So important for more and more women to be in the technology field and really diversity of all kinds. It's critical to our business. We can't have five guys named Bob staring at a problem trying to come up with a creative answer because, let me tell you, they're all going to come up with the same exact answer. We need to have people from different genders, different ethnic backgrounds, different um, religious backgrounds, different countries, different cultures of all kinds staring at really hard problems that we face every day and how can we leverage technology in the best way and what's the best idea to solve problems? So this is a really fundamentally imperative action and, and, a, and piece of work that we're doing on the Girls for Tech program. And as Marissa said, we both have gotten to participate in this uh, fabulous program that we have created. And it is so rewarding to see the girls that go through this program who are of middle school age generally uh, coming, who may not have been exposed to different kinds of technology in the past and may have had a particular stereotype of what that is. And it's just very rewarding to see the awareness that girls uh, face and, and have, of, oh, I, I didn't know that was technology and I didn't know that I was good at that and I didn't know that I had an interest in that and that's really something I wanna kind of continue new and explore, it's really rewarding to see that kind of reaction from the girls. Yeah, I, would, I would agree, definitely echo that. Um, because the girls, they're so engaged and they have great energy and they all come from you know, different backgrounds, but when they come together, they're just excited to learn. And they really, it's like you see a, a light bulb go off in their heads. They get a glimpse of what their future could be. And I just, I love doing it because I love being able to, you know, see them opening up themselves to wider possibilities for their future. That's fantastic. It sounds like an exciting program. So wh what are the barriers to girls pursuing STEM fields? And how is this initiative seeking to address some of those systematic barriers? Well, you know, Corinne and Kim, uh, I think there's a crisis on the planet uh, these days. As you mentioned, and as we've said, there just are not enough girls uh, staying interested in STEM. There's not, not enough young ladies going into engineering degrees in colleges and universities, and there's not enough women in the technology field. In 10 years, there's going to be more jobs on the planet that require some technology knowledge and, and uh, or STEM uh, in general uh, than there are kids graduating with the, these kinds of degrees and programs. And girls are dropping out uh, more and more at, at the young age of middle school, 10, 10 years old or so. I wish I knew why particularly. 
if there was one thing that could fix it, believe me, I would be fixing it as with a lot of people in the in the industry and a lot of uh, women on the planet would be trying to to fix this uh, if there was just one thing. But you know, there's a lot of different theories of why these barriers exist. Um, you know, some of them I think society may not have done us any favors. You know, girls play are supposed to play with dolls, and you go to the toy store, and you see nothing but the pink aisle. You know, but boys are supposed to play with Legos and, and engineering type toys. You know, maybe it starts as young as what kind of toys our children are playing with. Some people theorize that uh, girls might think a STEM kind of curriculum or a technology kind of field is just about being a coder. Now, honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a coder. I, I'm a coder. That's how I started. I'm a computer programmer. I started here at MasterCard. Uh, doing that, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not, technology fields are not so one-dimensional. And I think girls need exposure. There's a, a whole host of different disciplines and careers that you can have, and I think, you know, maybe girls are thinking, oh, I just ha I'm just a coder if I'm in a technology field. Well, I think really they need exposure to to role models, and they need to see that there are people like them that look like them, that do these kinds of jobs and that they can do it too. That I think will build the confidence that they can do it too and just opens doors for them. So I think, I think there just are these kinds of barriers that have been put in place. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we need to, we aim to change some of those things. Yeah, Dana, one of the things that comes up a lot of times when we talk about persistence through kind of STEM curricula in really K through 12 education, we talk about it as if it's a pipeline, but a leaky one, meaning that students don't, aren't retained within that pipeline, but really kind of, kind of leak out of the sides. And I like what you said, uh, which is kind of a framework that's emerging, which is that it's pathways, that there are multiple ways to en enter the field. And it might be in an arts-based curriculum that you can come at any time even as, as, as Corinne talked about, even after having a, a career in another field, that there are opportunities and pathways to, um, to enter a field. So I, I love what you said and what you were starting to talk about with regard to role models. And one of the, one of the things that I think the science of really how fields become accessible, particularly for low-income kids, kids from marginalized communities, is really being able to see visible role models. You talked about yourself um, as, a, as a coder. Um, certainly that, if, if you are a volunteer in the program, I can see that that would be really encouraging for, for young people to see. Talk a little bit, if you would, just about who participates from the company um, and how you, know, how you sign them up, what you talk to them about in terms of role modeling, things like that. I can jump in on, on that one if, uh, if you'd like me to take that, Dana. Yeah. Um, actually, if I can just back up, and I just wanted to piggyback on something that Dana said on the prior question, and then I'll get to the, to the role modeling question. But I just also want to um, make the point that, you know, we're talking about girls here, but I know that you're also focused on, you know, women and women in the workforce and, and their entry into STEM. And Girls for Tech is just one example of how MasterCard is helping women enter and stay in the technology workforce. Um, we have a number of other programs and initiatives, um, like our Launch Code program in the U.S., where we partner with a nonprofit to um, connect people to training and education in the tech industry. So that's uh, an example of how we're helping people get, you know, entry um, and other pathways into technology. Um, and then we offer apprenticeships and um, with the possibility of permit, permanent positions with the company. So that's one example. We also recently expanded our Relaunch Your Career program globally, um, and that helps experienced professionals who've left the workforce for various reasons, maybe to raise children or to care for a sick parent. Um, things that tend to fall more on to women, um, we help them re-enter the workforce. So instead of an internship, it's more like a returnship, again, with the possibility of securing a, a permanent position. So there are a number of ways also to help women take alternate paths into technology and, and help to build the pipeline. 
in the industry. So with that, your role modeling question, which I love, it's a, it's a great question because I completely agree that role modeling is such an important thing for girls and even for women who are already in the workforce. And, you know, I think we want to we want to encourage girls to be trailblazers, of course, but it's hard for them to envision themselves in a role if they've never seen anyone who looks like them in that type of role. And that's one of the things I really love about Girls for Tech, because we do recruit both men and women from all different parts of the company, from all different backgrounds across the globe. And for me personally, as a woman of color, one of the reasons that I volunteer here, aside from the fact that it's just a lot of fun, is that many of the girls who come through the program are black and brown girls, and they need to see black and brown mentors. So, you know, it's important for all the girls, really, regardless of their ethnicity, to see mentors from a variety of backgrounds. But, you know, you know, I do think they need to see, they need to see both men and women. They need to see people of different races. They need to see different ages. But, you know, they want to see people who look like them. And I think it helps them to understand, oh, you know, a career in technology really can be for everyone, including me. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of the time that needs to be put in for, for girls to see who's actually doing this and seeing different visual role models coming from age and background and ethnicity and culturally helps them to put themselves in your shoes and see themselves in your shoes because everybody has a different story. You know, because all of the mentors are all MasterCard employees, we're clearly all working in a technology company. So that, you know, just reinforces the idea and gives us the opportunity to be role models to these girls because not all of us, you know, have engineering degrees or data scientists, but that's fine, that's, that's okay because we're showing them that there are many different paths to a career in technology. Yeah, and that's critical that, especially the piece about not necessarily having to have an engineering degree, but mm -hmm. seeing that the woman with the engineering degree or the person of color with the engineering degree and the person of color with another degree all have kind of interesting career paths is also something that needs to be modeled and seen. That, you know, some uh, very often, and I learned this with Beauty Biz Camp, is that you can't dream about something you don't know about. So right. the more that you are able to see the possibilities, the more that, that, that you're able to craft a, a possible or dream about directions that you may want to go in in the future. So let's talk about the program and, and delivery of the program. So as, as technology adapts and changes, especially in your industry with the data services, algorithms, and digital payments, Teaching these topics, these related topics at middle school level can present challenges, you know, to middle school math and science teachers. I know that MasterCard volunteers are there. What support is in place to aid classroom instruction and continuing education? And how does your partnership with Scholastic help you to achieve your goals? So it's an interesting observation that technology changes rapidly. <laughs> it's a real quandary in the business, I would say, because it's, I really think technology advances faster than medicine these days. So, so that becomes a quandary as we're trying to work with teachers and the educational systems. It's an important element of our programs and MasterCard's thinking at large of how we're trying to cha make a generational change, really. So I guess I would say a few things. One, it's just as important to teach the teachers as it is to, to expose the girls to things that they may not have seen before, such as technology and STEM uh, kinds of fields. So we really do put a focus on that in, when we're working and develop, when we develop this Girls for Tech program, and we make sure that we're inviting the teachers, we're including the teachers, the teachers are sitting down understanding our curriculum and seeing, seeing it in action. In fact, we are, really positively rewarded by the fact that the teachers come back, they return to our programs, and they're executing some of the things that we've taught some of the exposed some of the girls, such as a cryptography sort of a little workstation. They are bringing that into their curriculum in the school. And we're now thinking and focusing on how can we have a girls for tech program that's sort of teachers for tech, <laughs> kind of oriented around the teachers, and helping with the curriculum 
so that we can aid that and kind of keep the flywheel going, if you will. I guess I'd also say one thing that's really important to MasterCard and to me personally, I'm engaged with university level as well, trying to look at what's the state of future careers. So a cybersecurity career, by example, is in huge demand, in huge need. You know, it's a, it's a crazy world out there, and we need to protect it. And uh, in the financial industry particularly, and in our industry, you know, safe and safety of payments is really important to us. So uh, we focus on this a lot. We, we need more cybersecurity people in the world. We'd love for them to be women. So we partner with local universities, Washington University here in St. Louis, which is an amazing school. And we are working with them on what we expect in the workforce, what kinds of people we need, what kind of jobs we have. And they, WashU, is, is focusing on evolving their cybersecurity degrees. And, uh, and curriculum. And so we're helping shape their curriculum. Uh, they're creating new programs, new majors, um, and, and they're also then reciprocally coming uh, to our place of employment. We have thousands of engineers here and really educating our engineers here on some of the things that they teach at school as well. So we have this nice kind of uh, circular thing going on that's uh, reciprocal, that we're helping to shape their degree programs, and they're helping to shape our workforce in areas that are evolving. And I think that's an important element for us as well that builds upon what we're doing on the Girls for Tech. And then, you know, another point that I would just put on the table that I think is really important, and I, I share this a lot when I talk to a lot of girls or women or, or young ladies at uh, university or you know, it's the other 50% of the planet of the, of the men, gender as well. What's really important, I think, is to teach people to fish. So what we're teaching now, particularly at middle school age, is not what's going to be happening in the workforce when they get to the workforce. Technology changes far too fast. So what I think is really important to teach girls and, and people really of, of any age about curiosity, about lifelong learning, about being passionate about something and really digging in and uh, wanting to learn about. I feel like if we can teach girls and women and, and uh, people of all flavors, really, to have a hunger and a thirst for knowledge, that's really going to serve them well. And that's where we're going to see real payoffs in the future. And, and girls opting into STEM, staying with STEM, women going into engineering degrees, and women getting into the technology workforce. So I think that's kind of how we need to, to think about this. And I guess as I use that to kind of parlay into the point about our partnership with Scholastic, you know, you think of Scholastic as a learning entity, a learning organization. I remember the Highlights magazines when I was a little girl and, you know, Clifford the Red Dog, Big Red Dog, and all the wonderful things that they brought to the world, they are a natural partner for us in our ability to really get to the world and get to our quest to expose hundreds of thousands of girls to, to the, uh, the technology and STEM field. So we here at MasterCard believe if it doesn't scale, it doesn't matter. And so we really want to get to partnerships. We want to get to girls through partnerships. And Scholastic has given us an open new avenues for us to expose technology, STEM, curriculum, girls for tech to an audience at uh, the grade three through grade seven through, through the work that they've already done. So it's kind of a one plus one equals three to us and helps us scale what we're really trying to do. So it's a really nice partnership for us. And we're, we're very proud to be with Scholastic. So, so many things I, uh, that you talked about that were just kind of spot on and I want to amplify. So one is the investment in teachers as really a sustainable long-term strategy. Having teachers have the tools that will long outlast even kind of a, an effort like the Girls for Tech initiative is, is a really a noteworthy strategy. Also, Getting girls to think critically about their careers, about, about the actual content, I think, is something that 
is invaluable, frankly, in, um, in their career pursuits, whether they pursue a tech career or not. So I think that's a very strong, sustainable strategy. Uh, and you talked about the partnership with, with Wash U, which is a wonderful, wonderful school and, and private and very expensive. So besides the scholastic partnership, I'd be curious, are there, are there partners in place that you would want to highlight that specifically uh, focus on the most marginalized communities, those with less access to resources and, and just information? So I noticed beige vests on uh, one of the photos of girls. Are there other partners that you want to let our listeners know about that are really specifically focused on uh, marginalized communities? Well, Marissa, I'll tee you up in a minute, but one thing I wanted to introduce uh, and share is I'm on the board of a, a group called National Academy Foundation. And there, it's run by the fabulous J.D. Hoy, who, who is, uh, is running that organization. And their mission in life is to really be able to expose at the high school level kids, not specifically women necessarily, but, um, but kids to the STEM curriculum uh, to continue their education, get them into the college ranks in some sort of a, a STEM field. They, they have other kind of curriculums, but we certainly have interest in their STEM focus, and then be gainfully employed and leverage their partnerships in the private sector, NAF, uh, National Academy Foundation, we call it NAF. NAF's uh, connections in the private industry to really help, you know, employ these kids. And they, they have a curriculum that they feel like if the kids will achieve these particular milestones, um, including uh, a high school internship, a paid internship, which helps prepare them for the, for the workforce and, and for college prior to that, uh, that, that they are well suited for the next step in life. And they, they certify high schools in, that are uh, underprivileged kids for the most part in, in different places. So that's a really nice partnership that we have that I'm very proud to be a part of that organization that really has a big goal in life of getting more and more underprivileged kids that may not have otherwise been exposed, that may not otherwise have had the opportunities to see what is out in the world, uh, to be able to really get into a, a eventually a, a, a technology or an engineering kind of field that um, by preparing them earlier in life. So I'm, I'm proud to be part of that organization. And Marissa, perhaps you have some other things that you'd like to add into that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of uh, looking at different partners, it really varies by region. We do work with a number of different organizations that connect girls in the local communities where we operate, um, and we've even created some customized curriculum for a few of the partners. But we've run, at this point, um, Girls for Tech programs in 21 countries, nine different languages. We've reached about 75,000 girls to this point, and the focus is clearly on underserved communities and schools, because that's clearly where the greatest need is. And one example I can mention a partnership that we did here in New York City was with um, a Girl Scout troop. There's a, a Girl Scout troop called Troop 6000. They're a Girl Scout program that's designed to serve girls in the New York City shelter system. So these girls, you know, are, are homeless, um, and we were able to partner with that Girl Scout troop to bring them in and to have them go through the Girls for Tech program. And I know that was something that, you know, many a lot to us and meant a lot to the girls and it's you know the type of thing that we we look to do to reach you know underserved girls underserved communities where they won't have you know typically have exposure to these types of programs that uh, the troop 6000 boy that is amazing we're we're both you know native new yorkers we grew up in new york so we are very familiar with that troop and just the the fact that that they had an opportunity to experience that program is mm -hmm. amazing. So kudos to MasterCard for doing that. Let's talk about just the impact of the program now. So you've been doing this for a number of years now. So what is working well for you guys? What have you seen? What are the benefits of 
at its impact? Like, how, are you still in touch with the first students, for example? Um, what have you learned since the program has launched? And what are you hearing from the field? What's the, the feedback? I know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I ran my first Beauty Biz Camp program in 2013. And now some of those girls, one of my girls is graduating from college and I still hear from her. And she says that she still applies some of the lessons that she learned that summer to her work now. So I'm sure that, you know, the avenues that you're opening up have, have netted a lot of results from the students who have taken your program. So please tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we absolutely do, you know, continue to follow up with many of the girls and have them come back and, you know, go through the program again, or um, we've done sort of like a, a graduation for Girls for Tech participants. I think one thing that we learned is that regardless of the language and the location, the girls react to the program in exactly the same way all over the, girl, all over the globe. The curriculum is really very hands-on and it's inquiry-based, so that really resonates with all the girls regardless of, of where they are. So, I mean, you can talk about cryptology, but it's much better to learn cryptology by actually cracking codes. And, you know, big data might sound boring, but when you use that data to solve a school problem, they really get a light bulb call, goes off. And, you know, we talk about things like fraud detection, and, you know, that might sound great in theory, but when you're actually using the empirical knowledge and even, you know, see the girls use their gut instincts to, fraud, to solve a fraud case, it's even better. So, you know, those are the things that I think we're really finding that that type of hands-on approach really works. And, you know, the girls are experiencing real world challenges. And our hope is that, you know, that will help them become future problem solvers of the world. I have learned, I have to tell you that what we are doing is important. And what the curriculum we have is working to see the girls' confidence when they know they can do something that they didn't think they could do previously, and to see the light bulbs go off with, oh, I can do that, and I didn't know I could, or I didn't know that I was meant to be in technology, or I'm meant to have that kind of career. It's so rewarding, and it's so needed. So I've really learned, aside from all the things that Marissa said of, you know, it really is working and it works everywhere in the world. It's, it translates to every country in the world. And, and, but I've learned that it's the right thing to do and it is making a difference in the world. Uh, so I'm positively reinforced that this is the right thing for, for our company to do. And it's the right thing for many, many companies on the planet to do as well. That is a wonderful final word. Our time has really flown by uh, together. We One final question for both of you. It, what role might our listeners play in supporting this effort? I think it is important for everybody that hears this podcast. And thank you for, for bringing this story to the, to the masses to get involved. There is a crisis on the planet. There are lots of ways for companies and individuals to be involved, be a mentor to a, a girl or a woman uh, in technology or in STEM curriculum or engineering fields at large, be a, not only a mentor, but be a sponsor, talk to kids about what it means to be in the STEM curriculum and STEM fields, share with girls that they need to stay in STEM, that it's okay to let your voices be heard that there are really no boundaries for their, for their life. And there's so many doors that can be open to them. And it's all of our jobs to really pay it forward in this world and, and to expose girls and, and uh, kids to the different choices that they have. I would completely agree and echo that. Um, mentorship and sponsorship, I think, is, is a really critical, especially at an early age. You know, getting to them early, getting them interested, curious to learn more. I think that's that's really what listeners can do. I think we're what we're trying to do is help these girls grow into you know smart, capable and driven and you know, women who when someone tells them that they can't do something, you know, they say, Screw you, I'm gonna do it anyway. 
one of the things I like to ask uh, people after I, I talk to them about MasterCard or our technology footprint or, or anything that, uh, that we're talking about is, and I would like to ask your listeners, uh, to, I would like to say today, go home to your girls, your daughters, your nieces, your neighbors, uh, and tell them that today you met the person that runs MasterCard's network worldwide, globally, that makes payments happen every day. And she's a girl. And they can do that and more if they stay on STEM. That is amazing. That is something that we can all say. So when when this this podcast airs, we're gonna ask our listeners to 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 say that to a girl themselves. Because knowing that a woman is behind the technology of such a global powerhouse is awe-inspiring. We, are, we will certainly have our listeners do that. We cannot thank you, Marissa and Dana, uh, enough for, for spending this time with us and to, for enlightening us not only on this program, but your dedication to girls, to the, the diverse community, and to changing the face of STEM and to growing the STEM workforce. Just not now. I mean, just, uh, just creating not only a pipeline, but a pathway. We really thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. And thank you for using your platform for, for doing good in the world. That's our show for today. Look for the latest installment of the Visible Women podcast every other Wednesday, where we'll tackle issues and experiences that relate to appearance, diversity, and inclusion that are relevant to your lives. Check out our website, visiblewomenpodcast.com, where you can find out more about the episode and follow us on our social channels. Make sure you join our Facebook group to participate in discussions about our latest episode. Until then, here's to all the visible women out there. Never forget that we see you.